Um, all right, yeah, it's three o'clock. All right, so let's just start off at chapter one over here. I hope everybody is in the uh, is in the Leechess study. So yeah, let's start off with the con structure. So they play e4, right? You play c5, typical Sicilian so far. Knight f3, and this the con specifically is an e6 playing d6. And then this becomes an open Sicilian where um, people just take, 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 and uh, d6 is played. But in here, e6 is played. And um, this is actually somewhat interesting. So the reason that e6 is uh, e6 and d6 are both normally allowed in the Sicilian, but e6 is kind of like, I want to say it's like a dreamer Sicilian because. Uh, the, the deal with the Sicilian is if you can play d5 safely in a Sicilian, you're generally always better. So if you play e6, you're propping up d5 eventually. Maybe not now, maybe not, maybe not like, uh, maybe not like in a near future, but eventually you're going to be trying to play d5. And, um, you know, you might have to play d6 and d5 just to control the space around, around your king. Um, but what's really, really nice is you're going to be going for d5, so you're really going to have a lot of ambition in this game. And um, uh, d6, you know, d6, people say, is a more principled way of playing it. But a lot of people will think that d6 and e6 are the same. And uh, that actually leads to a lot of trouble because d6 and e6, although it's just one tiny little pawn move, it's not the same. And um, there are many, many situations where people will try to play like a Nidorf, like a Nidorf as white against you, and you can just punish them. You can completely destroy them because, because, because of the difference between d6 and e6. e6 allows you to get your bishop out or your dark spread bishop out much, much quicker. Uh, when you play when you play d6, and for example, let's say you play e6 afterwards, you can't get your bishop out because the the pawn on d6 makes it so you can't get your bishop out. And I've I've had so many wins where people just like try to play the white side of a knight orf because they're like, oh, e6, d6, uh, what's the difference? And then they just they just lose. They're like lost out of the opening. All right, so um, let's just go over the main con structure. So e6. Um, they normally play d4, like, out of all of the, out of all of, like, the, uh, out of all of the moves that are played on move 3, d4 is the most common. This is the open Sicilian, right? Except it's an e6 open Sicilian. So you just take, take, and, um, the move here is a6. So there are other moves here, but this is specifically the con. So once you've reached this position, you are now in the Sicilian con. And um, it's, it's very weird because you're, it looks like you're just developing pawns and you're not really controlling the center. But the idea of the con is to like control all the space around you super well, make sure that he doesn't have any pawn breaks, and then get your pieces to the optimal squares. And uh, just try to control and make sure that he can't open up the position and destroy you. because. As black, you have to accept that you're going to be slightly worse. But if your opponent can't open up the position and tactically destroy you, and you put all your pieces on their best possible squares, then you should be very good. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot about understanding how to uh, make sure that you, the position won't open up. And then once you get your pieces on the best possible squares, you get to open things up, and then you just smack down your opponent. It's really, really nice. So after a6, the move uh, most people play is knight c3. And then um, this is what I mean by developing your queen on move 5. You play queen c7. And um, I drew a lot of arrows here. I'll get rid of them right now. But um, this is just the main development style of the con. Uh, you want to get your pieces to all of these nice squares. So very common ideas is first develop this knight. Um, then push this pawn, develop this bishop, develop this bishop either here or here, 
then push this pawn, and then bring this knight into uh, d7. And um, those that are familiar with playing this kind of structure might also recognize the move knight to c6. And that sometimes happens in the con. Um, but it's, it's uh, generally, if you play knight to c6 first, it's called the Taimanov. And the Taimanov and Khan are very, very closely related. Um, the, the advantages of going to d7 over c6. d7, um, as I said before, in the Khan, you want to get your pieces on the best possible squares. And sometimes it'll take more time to do that. But your structure is just going to be so solid that it's going to be hard for them to open it up. And the idea is with d7, uh, you get to go to c5. You might even be going to d5 and then c4 after you push b5. So um, your pieces are going to be on very, very strong squares. And, it's, and they're going to have to make uh, some bad pawn weaknesses if they want to push your pieces away. So um, let, let's, let's just talk about the general pawn structure in um, the con. And the pawn structure that you guys will see most often after when you've reached this position is called um, the hedgehog. And the hedgehog is characterized by having pawns here or here. And the uh, let me just show you guys. So this is like some pretty natural development. Right, so uh, if you take a look at the pawn structure, right here. This is the this is called the hedgehog pawn structure. And you're missing a C pawn and they're missing a D pawn, which is pretty normal. Um, but you have you have all of these pawns controlling these squares right here. And it's uh, the reason it's called a hedgehog is because uh, there's no pawn breaks that really work. And you're controlling so much space. If I unhighlight these squares and just show you you're controlling these squares, you're controlling these squares in the center, right? So um, it's kind of like spiny, like a hedgehog. Like if, if you imagine this is like the hedgehog eye, this is like the round hump of its head, right? Um, you, you just have like a bunch of spines coming, uh, coming around here. And um, no pawn breaks really, really work. Nobody has any questions so far. All right, great. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, it's very, very hard to find a pawn break for white. They might go for something like f4, f5, but um, most most players will play f3 before they play f4, so that just like wastes the tempo. And in the meanwhile, you're gonna getting you're gonna be getting your pieces to the best possible squares, and you're just gonna attack after that. So. Um, yeah, that's that's the basic idea of the con. Um, if they if they uh, have like some kind of weird development that you've never seen before, you can always default to this system where you try to just bring your your pieces in like this. See, um, generally in an opening, you uh, someone will have a bad bishop and a good bishop. Your good bishop is actually your dark squared bishop, and your bad bishop is your light squared bishop. But this this bad bishop is really really good because it's on the long diagonal. It's not obtruded by d five. It's it's a very very good bad bishop um, compared to his bad bishop right here. I mean that bishop. I mean it's attacking this pawn, but I don't really care about that pawn. You know, like and it's it's currently being guarded to to make a pawn weakness over here. They have to push a four and and we, instead of taking on a four or letting them take, we just play b four. All right, so let's just go into the con main line. Um, this is. Although this is the main line of the con, this is not the uh, this is not the variation that you'll see most often because most people just have no idea how to play against the con. So um, the con main line goes, uh, yeah, this is the main con position. Uh, they play bishop d three, and bishop d three is the main line, but um, you play bishop c five, and uh, they can play bishop e three. So uh, uh, when they play bishop d3, their queen is no longer defending their knight. Um, so, uh, yeah. Because their queen is no longer defending the knight, you just attack the knight. And they can, they can develop and um, they can develop and defend at the same time. 
But now they're kind of like in this awkward pin, right? So this this pin is kind of awkward. Uh, they don't want to move the knight because then you take and you just double their pawn structure, right? And your bishop is defended, so there's no kind of discoveries like this trying to uh, trying to make it so that if you take, you can take back. Because if they played, for example, knight f5 right now, you'd just be able to take, right? And your piece is protected. So there's no like hit and run strategies where you take the bishop and then they take back with the knight. Yeah, so um, this this just becomes very uncomfortable. Bishop e3, you just you just keep your bishop here. Eventually, you can pile up on it. So um, bishop e3 is actually just a bad move here. the The best move is actually knight b3. And now that this bishop has done its job here, you actually just swing the bishop back. And this is this is theory. Um, this is not theory that you'll that you'll see very often. I've only actually of the thousands of hedgehog and Sicilian con games that I've played, I think I've only entered this position like five times. <laughs> it's actually crazy. Like it's so uncommon that people actually know what they're doing in the con. Um, and the so if you had just developed your bishop here originally, you never would have been able to kick this knight back here. So this tempo putting the bishop here and then swinging it back. Actually, the only reason for that is to bring the knight to a less active square. That's the only reason. Because this, this development is awkward, so he's just going to go back. And um, yeah, so he's going to go back. We swing, we swing our bishop back. And this is the main line of the con. Um, a friend, National Master uh, LD0, who I think is in chat right now, actually played this against me yesterday and i was super surprised that he knew the theory um and uh so yeah uh th the idea here is that after you play g6 protecting your pawn you know making sure that he doesn't have any attack you don't want to play something like uh this because that development awkward um your knight really wants to be here uh uh, you can bring your knight here, I guess, but uh, it's not it's not the best. So um, you play you play g six, and again, this is like the dreamer Sicilian. You wanna you wanna maybe eventually bring your bishop back here and get a hedgehog structure, but instead you have a bishop on this long diagonal instead of the bishop here, right? So this is what I mean by having your pieces be really really awesome. What if he does put that bishop behind the knight? I feel like most people playing against me will do that. Yes. So if he brings the bishop behind the knight in this scenario, um, you just you just keep the pin, right? You just continue developing your pieces, right? And this pin is going to be awkward until like he brings his queen maybe in to defend like this. Aren't you lacking in development? Yes. But there's no good way to take advantage of it. Like, uh, for example, if I turn on the engine right now, it won't, it won't have any, like, it won't have any problems with this. Um, and uh, I think there's, like, this big beginner mentality of, like, oh, if I'm, if I'm behind in development, I'm going to, like, lose the game, right? But, like, if, it's only if your opponent can really take advantage of it, right? If, you, if your opponent can't take advantage of it, then... Um, the lack of development you you're you're going to be spending time putting your pieces on the best possible squares and your opponent's just going to be dilly that dallying um yeah so that that's that's like just how the Sicilian con is it's not an easy position to attack grandmasters have failed against it like and and uh i like set traps against my international master uh coach in it before and like people just don't know how to play against it. It's not a um. Uh, I don't have a YouTube. Sorry. Um. It's not a. Uh, yeah. It's not a very very system. A, a very very easy system to attack. It's it's actually a favorite of a lot of very strong players because it's so frustrating to attack. I mean the one you're gonna upload the lecture on. Oh, okay. Yeah. We have a chess academy YouTube. Um. I'll be sure to post it at the end of the of the lecture. Oh, yeah, someone already has it has done it for me. All right, yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, here you just maintain the pin, and if he ever like moves away, for example, like here, and then I don't know, if he finds the pin unbearable, you take 
double pawns. I think you're pretty happy with double pawns, right? And you know, if he doesn't take, you just maintain the pin, right? You you don't want to take here with your with your bishop, but um, uh, because that would just make his bishop better. Um, you just you just want to wait for that pin, like you know, whenever you pin a piece on a queen, like normally when you do like oh this pin, or you you use your bishop to pin a knight to a queen, and you just leave it there until um uh, until like it basically makes the, the the piece kind of useless, right? So this piece is kind of useless because then you capture behind it and then you uh, and then you uh, trade the bishops and he has double pawns. Why would you be happy with taking a pawn over a bishop? Why can't you take? Uh, what do you mean? Which which bishop can I take? If you can't take something after, oh, well, double pawns are bad, right? Like we we all know double pawns are not the greatest. Yeah, so like if he if he recaptures, gives himself double isolated pawns. I think you're pretty pretty happy with um, having double isolated pawns. Okay, so um, I guess backing up, if you're like a really basic beginner, um, double pawns are bad. Double pawns are when you have two pawns on the same file. Like let's say like double eight or double h pawns over here, and they're bad because are they actually these are double isolated pawns. And um, isolated pawns are bad because they can't be defended by any other pawn. That just means, um, so yeah, in this scenario, these pawns cannot be defended by any other pawns, right? They're isolated because there's no pawns in the D file or F file, right? So um, uh, these pawns are just really, really weak. They can't be defended, and um, they're doubled. So really, um, they're just not good. Yeah, they can easily be attacked. Uh, they're not easily defended. Like it's very, very uncomfortable to have double pawns, especially since, um, like these ones are isolated. Double isolated pawns, triple isolated pawns. They're like the worst kind of pawns that you can have in a in a game of chess. Yeah, so he he doesn't want to do that. Um, let's just go over a game in the main line of the con, and this was played. Um, this was played by. Uh, an international master, I am Fins. I think most of you recognize John Bartholomew. He's like a pretty big chess personality, and um, he played he played a, a game on ICC against uh, a guy named Alakine, spelled wrong, but um, we'll ignore that. Uh, so e4, c5, and we get this typical Sicilian uh, con structure. He opts to play this kind of system, and it'll eventually transpose into the mainline of the con. Normally, main line is here and then here, but uh, we'll see how this transposes. So, uh, bishop here, knight back, remember? And then bishop back, right? This is the main idea. So, they castle, uh, Finns play d6. Uh, yeah, most people know I am, no, I'm not streaming. You have to go to the Lee Chess study. Yes, okay. So, they castle d6 and queen to g4 attacking this pawn right um so g6 was played and queen to uh uh queen to e2 and queen to e2 just make sure that when we develop the knight it doesn't come with tempo and that's actually kind of important the reason is uh black has already provoked this kind of weakness and uh it is kind of a weakness because if the bishop is not being cut out here um this structure can be very very weak and the idea is that you can't develop your knight or else bishop comes here and you can't castle. Or you have to trade your, your dark squared bishop and you don't want to do that. Um, so yeah, uh, you, don't want, you, you don't want to develop this knight just yet. That's, that's the idea with uh, kind of provoking this weakness and then just coming back. Um, so after, after this, you, you know, you just bring your queen to the natural development square. This eventually becomes a Moroxy bind and, um, uh, Moroxy bind being when there's a pawn on both C4 and E4. We'll get, we'll get into that structure later. I have a, a few games that, that, uh, are played in the Moroxy bind. They played F4, right? And now F4 doesn't allow the bishop to come here anymore, right? Because now the pawn is blocking. Right, so 
we can now develop our knight. Oh, John Bartholomew decides not to develop his knight for some reason. But um, I've checked. Yeah, if you if you check the uh, the masters data- database, this was this was like a a, a rapid game. So uh, I'm sure John probably just doesn't know the theory. You can play knight f6. You can see right here it says knight gf6 has the most games played of it, and it has the highest win rate. So yeah, knight gf6 is the best move here. You're not going to re- get into this position, but the idea is if they ever, you know, uh, ha- if they ever block the diagonal in any way, you can already play knight f6. Yeah. So John Bartholomew doesn't do it, but I don't think it matters. It's probably transposes. Um, yeah, and a big idea in the Sicilian con is uh, once you have your bishop on this long diagonal, you want to pry that diagonal open. You want to play h5, h4, h3. Maybe like stick your, and if they like try to play h3 themselves, then you try to stick your knight onto this square after you, after you play h4. And that knight right there will be very, very annoying. You can even sack the pawn just to get the open file and uh, try and crush them. This is like a very, very common idea in the con. Um, you have to be okay with sacking an h-pawn. And I think most of you should be like sacking an h-pawn to get an open file, maybe even castling opposite sides, doubling on the h-file, like uh, an h-pawn is not worth that much, you know what I mean? The open file in this scenario, if you castle opposite sides, is worth way more than the h-pawn. All right, so, um, yeah, so push, push, and uh, the this guy decided to try to sack a piece, um, and this is like a fundamental misunderstanding of how the con works so normally when you play against like um normally when you play against an e6 sicilian the knight will come to c6 and this tactic knight to d5 actually works if the knight comes to c6 and the reason for that is because after takes and takes if your knight is on c6 it's pinned and you get to win the piece back but in this scenario, you don't get to win the piece back. You get to win a bit of a center, but there's like there's no piece that's pinned on c6 anymore, right? So knight to d7 has thoroughly prevented this tactic. Um, yeah, so after this, uh, John Bartholomew is up a piece. There's a lot of counterplay for white, but um, if you're entering the con, I'm assuming that you're quite a tactical player already. The con is not for the... Uh, the faint of heart. You have to be really okay with um uh with uh just yeah. So after this um uh they're gonna play this try to try to take advantage of that pin piece, right? So John get, just gets out of the pin. After this takes takes and you don't want to take again, right? Because then this pin comes in and you lose your piece back, right? So queen here just trading queens. You're up a piece. Remember. Uh and. His opponent played e5, trying to get some counterplay in. John trades queens and just uh, continues to attack the pieces. And now that the queens are off, you can kind of like breathe easy because you know that you're just up a piece. If you can just kill all the counterplay, kill all those past pawns, then you're just going to be up a piece in the end game and you're just going to crush him. So there, takes, takes. Yep, blockading, right? making sure that you blockade all of these pawns, right? So uh, the only way that that uh, white can win is if you let his pass pawns become too dangerous. So um, this is kind of getting further in. You're, you're, uh, you're never going to reach this position, but John just trades all the pieces, and his opponent resigns in this position, just down a piece. Yeah. All right, so... Um, that's one of the, uh, that's one of, uh, so 95 is actually like 95 all the way back here when his opponent sacked a piece. That is a pretty common tactic in a lot of Sicilians um, and a lot of Smith Moras, uh, but it doesn't work here. 97 just prevents it. Yep. All right. So um, th- that's what I mean. The con is kind of like a weird Sicilian. Like people will try to play against it, like they play against other Sicilians. And they just won't realize that the moves just don't work. All right, so um, let's go over the fundamental difference between the con and the Nidorf. I mentioned it before, 
Uh, the Night Orf, you play d6 and then you play a6. And in the Khan, you play e6 and then you play a6. So um, this fundamental move difference actually makes a huge difference. So um, if we play, if we go down this uh, d6 line, this is like, this is a pretty normal idea in the Night Orf. This is actually called the English attack, I think. Oh, I think, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's this English attack. Yeah, this is called the English attack over here. Um, and this is like a very, very common idea, just like castle queen side and um, just uh, attack, attack black, right? Um, if I turn on the engine, this says pretty good for white, right? It says zero point uh, plus zero point five. Now let's see what happens when I play the con structure instead of the night orb structure. So after takes takes uh, here here, this is the exact same moves. Um, but now now this f three is a little bit too weakening. So if I play bishop b four right here, um, remember how I said there's two squares that your bishop wants to go to. Uh, you can either go to uh, e7 or b4. I said that at the very beginning in the con structure. Um, this actually makes the difference because if, if they played f3, that's just way too slow. You can now bring your bishop to b4 and start attacking. Yeah, f3 is good. Uh, f3 is bad, only good against the knight orf. Well, uh, it's good against a lot of Sicilians, which is not good against the con. Um, so here, yep, you can already play d5. Remember how I said d5 is what you want to play in every Sicilian, right? So, uh, they, they're trying to play this English attack where they castle next turn. You can play d5. They have to take, right? If you, if you take, take, and, t and then you can take here. His queen is pinned to his king. Even if he had castled in that scenario, you'd still be able to take on e5 and you'd be up a pawn. Uh, you think knight f6 is the best way to play against bishop d3, honestly? Um, I disagree. I like my system better. It's the main line of the con. Um, so, yeah, after after he takes, making sure that he doesn't lose a pawn, you just take back, and now f3 looks very, very silly, doesn't it? f3 is just kind of like... Uh, because it before it was propping up e4, right? But now the e4 pawn is gone. Um, if he castles king side, you know, it looks terrible. If he castles queen side, which he does uh, eventually. Yeah, here, here um, uh, someone just played this, and then I was able to take and take. And uh, even though you gave up your dark squared bishop, like, uh, if you're trading queens, you're 100% good. You're not going to lose this game. And um, even here, you can take... You can take the light squared bishop, or you can take the dark squared bishop instead, and save your own dark squared bishop. Uh, main line doesn't mean practical for us patsers. Yeah, I have, I've, I've literally played so few main line cons. I've only played it over the board, basically. Uh, there have been like three or four uh, to put their knight on b three. What do you mean? Huge positional inability castle, etc. What, what do you mean, Cell? The lines with queen g4 and bishop c5. Uh, queen g4 and bishop c5, yeah. Yeah, you, you put your bishop on c5, they move their knight back, right? Queen b3. Or, sorry, bishop, uh, knight b3. And then, you, and then you bring your bishop all the way home to uh, e7. Right, so basically, you just gained a tempo on the knight by playing bishop c5, and then you go back to, B7, uh, to e7, which was a square that was... Uh... Oh yeah, it's perfectly fine. I'm, I'm just saying that's the main line. You should know it in case, you know, someone plays against you, right? There, uh, so, like, there's no, there's no, like, like, there's no, um, there's no way to, like, be better as black against white, right? Like, there's no possible way that you can end up being better than white in all scenarios, right? I'm just saying that, that, um, <laughs> yeah, like, you can't be better than white if they play the correct moves. 
you know, he, I'm just saying that Black has a very, very strong winning chances. And it's very, very easy to play, very, very fun to play as Black. And most people just don't know how to play against it. Why can't you be better as Black? White gets the first move. Uh, you can't be better as Black ever, or else Black would win um, games, right? If, if White plays properly and Black plays properly, you can't be better as, as Black, right? White gets the first move. White will always be one, one um, point better in development, right? It's just impossible to be, to be better as Black. All right, okay, yeah, sorry. Sorry for that tangent, everyone. Um, here we can just take uh, and let, let's just let's just go in a game. So this is me against some 2300. Um, so after e4, c5, we've reached this natural con-like structure. They play bishop e2, and um, already this is a this is a bit slow, right? Bishop e2. Although it is a main move in the con, this means that it's slow enough for me to maybe not even consider bishop e7. I'm already considering bishop e4. So I play bishop e4, and now I'm threatening just to take, take, and win a pawn, and um, kind of shatter their pawn structure, give them double isolated pawns over here, um, and then try to win this pawn, right? So um, those that are familiar with the Sicilian know a pretty common exchange sack, where you get your rook on the open C file, and you sack for this, and then you win here. Um, and uh, you give up an, a rook for a piece, but you win the center pawn, and he gets double pawns on the C file, and it's uh, it's kind of awkward for him. Um, this is like the same thing, basically. So you're you're going to be taken here, and uh, it 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 does kind of stink to give up your bishop, but you're getting like two pawns and an attack, um, while your structure is still solid back here for it. So if if we look at the engine over here, it's already minus 0 0.3. Right. This is already this is already too slow in this scenario. Right. Bishop b4 just works. And uh there's only one continuation that that keeps that advantage for him. Everything else is like minus one after that. Uh what determines where I can put my dark squared bishop? How fast do they play? If they play too slow, you can play bishop b4. If they play, if they um, uh, develop properly, then bishop b4 probably doesn't work. Also, if they play a3, you don't play bishop b4. And a3 is a pretty common idea just to stop bishop b4. Uh, we'll go over those lines. But yeah, so after takes, takes, I am actually pretty happy in this position. If you see it's minus one, uh, this is like a 2300. He's already in minus one out of the opening on move 10. Right. So after takes, I didn't convert this perfectly. I am only human, but um, I w I went on to win this game, and uh, just because he was up, I he was up pawn, I was up pawns, and he was down on time. I kind of let him get an attack. Had to play g, uh, had to play g six, but it was okay. He just blundered it in the end in time trouble, so I was able to just take a rook and then and then just win. And you know when people get in time trouble, they they get in time trouble. They start making blunders. They they played a system they'd never seen before. You know it happens, right? But twenty three hundreds, right? You can beat twenty three hundreds with this opening, and they have no idea what to do. I was better on like move eight. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's one game. Let's go over another one. All right. This is me against some twenty one hundred. Uh, classical Constructure, yeah, Bishop D3, play the Knight in, they played F3 again, right? So, F3, again, doesn't work, right? I, uh, I think I pre-moved B4 because, um, this was like a Blitz game. So, uh, I, yeah, you're just supposed to play Bishop B4 here. But I, I pre-moved B4, um, and, uh, this is another common idea. If they don't play A3... You play you play b4 yourself. Right? Yeah, bishop b4 is the best move. I, I messed it up. Whoops. Um, I think I just pre-moved it. So uh so you can play b4 here, and if they don't play a3, right, and you already have a king side attack. So they they're they're trying to go for this English attack. And another idea with b4, kick the knight away from defending d5. 
So now d5 comes with so much greater attack, right? If they take, you take, you have a great knight in the center. Their knight is all the way back here, blocking in the development of their bishop. And um, yeah, they uh, you're just threatening to win a pawn, first of all. So uh, if, if they don't do anything about it, you're take, take and taking, because you have two attackers on here, so they don't have enough sufficiently, they can't sufficiently defend it. So they're really, really forced to take. And then after you take this, you're attacking their dark squared bishop. They have to like spend more tempi to like bring their dark squared bishop back. You have a knight in the center. You're just going to, you have an open C file to his king. This is like good. Um, yeah. What if they push E5 pressuring your knight? Oh, E5. Um, E5 works in some scenarios. So ac after E5, sometimes you have to bring your knight back. Sometimes you can take. I'm not sure if you can take in this scenario. You'd have to calculate it out. Uh, after e5, I think you have to play this, but this is still really good. Uh, if you if you get if you manage to get in d4, like you're this is now a closed position. You even have more time to set up all of your pieces. So if he if, if he pushes this, you get to you get to fianchetto your bishop. You get to bring your knight out, and you get to get this nice attack. You already have a head start on your opposite side castling attack, right? Why is takes bad here? I think if you take, there's this move, and your queen becomes very awkward. I think you have to play like queen here. It's it's not great. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not great. Um, yeah, so that's why you probably don't take there. But like e5, although although e5 is generally what a lot of what a lot of e4 players want to play in this scenario, it's really closing things up. And in the con, you would actually prefer things to be closed up uh, while you get your pieces out, and because you have a slight hindrance in development, right? So you want to get all your pieces out to their best possible squares, and then you want to open things up. That's that's the idea with the con. Yeah, that's plus 6.5. That's bad. That's not good. Yep. All right. So after this, uh, yeah, here he just hung his queen. I don't know. Some some people are bad. Some people just saw that this was a development move and then um, uh, forgot that he was going to hang his queen afterwards. So again, this is a blitz game. So he just he just badly hung his queen. It happens happens to the best of us. Um, and then after this, remember the con is is a tactical tactical play, right? So you have to always be careful. Here takes takes just giving him an isolated pawn. I just play this, so he can take this pawn, but it's it's dangerous. It's just going to open up more for me. And um, this knight, if it moves, if he takes the pawn, I get to go here win this bishop, right? So he gets the file first. I cover this pawn now. So now, uh, now I don't have the tactic of winning the bishop, right? He moves his knight back. I get to win this pawn. Oh, I'm gonna get my rooks on the second file. I'm just attacking this, attacking this. Yeah, this is disgusting, right? Against 2,100 players, they don't, they just don't know how to play against the con. All right, okay, let's uh, go over one more example of how you should be playing the con. Again, you reach this classical con structure, F3. Like, so many 2100 level players just play F3. It's, it's, it's disgusting what you can do to these people. Takes, takes. Yeah, this is actually the best move in the position, believe it or not. <laughs> this is the best move in the position. When you move your knight back, stopping the development of your bishop, just so that you can protect your other knight. That's the best move in the position. It, like, I'm pretty sure if I turn on the engine right here. Uh, it, it's actually not saying that it's the best move in the position. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm messing up the positions, but th this, is, this, this was one of the best moves in, in one of the positions that I had analyzed. And like, it, it's a move that makes sense, but it's, it's a very, very sad move to play. Like, knight away from the center, back, and like... Just hindering the development of his, light, of his light squared bishop already has terrible weaknesses by playing f3. Um, here, yeah, here you can just take the bishop. I would just, uh, if I was playing this now instead of, I think, like almost a year ago, then um, I would just take the bishop here, be happy with the bishop pair, and be happy with him playing, have, having him played f3, and maybe swing the bishop back to. Uh, 
swing the bishop back to e7, bring the knights out, play uh, b4, and have like this nice structure where I have two strong bishops. And uh, I would just be better in that scenario with him having played f3, having no attack. And uh, if he castles kingside without a likes for a bishop, he's dead. I mean, him playing f3, I have an open window to his king. Um, what's black's best move if white plays e5? Oh, we just went over that. Yeah, uh, here you're happy. You're happy just swing the knight back because now that your opponent has closed the structure, um, you have way more time to develop your pieces. Right, uh, you're you're going to be attacking this. Uh, yeah, so uh, we went over that a little while ago. You can look at the the previous game. All right, so yeah, I didn't I didn't take the dark squared bishop because I wanted more than the dark squared bishop because I was greedy, and this is not the best way to convert again. But um, this is this is like a strong tactical play that you get with the con. So I was able to come here, attack, and then take take. And I just decided I want a strong knight here, like pretty much unable to be taken um, against double isolated pawns. And uh, this was not the best conversion, but uh, it didn't matter. I, he, my opponent had no idea what he was doing. You can see he was like so low on time already. Um, the, three minutes against uh, five minutes. He, 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 just had to, he just didn't know what he was doing and he, uh, he blundered in time control, in uh, time trouble. Here, yeah. It was unable to protect this bishop any longer. So um, uh, let's go on to some other systems that you might see against the con. So not everyone is going to be playing uh, knight here, knight here, uh, knight here, knight here, right? So um, this is, this is uh, one of the more challenging structures that you're going to face against the con, and it's called the Meroxy Bind. I mentioned it a little bit beforehand. Um, so the Meroxy bind goes like this. Instead of playing knight here, they play c4. And uh, c4 is basically stopping d5 in a lot of scenarios. So that's why this move makes sense. But the disadvantage of the Meroxy bind is that his light squared bishop, it just ends up being like a terrible, terrible, terrible piece. So a lot of a lot of uh, ideas surrounding the Meroxy bind is just to, like trade all the pieces off except for his light squared bishop, and then just win good knight versus bad bishop, or win something like that. Um, and end games are generally favorable for you. Uh, with the Meroxy bind, they will have a lot more space and they can push for an attack, which is why the Meroxy bind is somewhat scary to play against. But um, yeah, this is like. Uh, um, the Moxie Bind, it, you can still get really, really good counterplay against it. So this is uh, also um, just one. The Moxie Bind is one scenario where um, you don't play queen to c7 first. So you can actually, uh, let's just go back actually a little bit. The reason that you play queen c7 um, in this scenario is that uh, if you were to play, whoops, uh, how do I get rid of all these arrows? Yeah, whoops, my battery's almost out. Okay, yeah, if you were to play uh, knight f3, or knight f6, sorry, instead, they can already play e5. So this this is already uncomfortable for you. Uh, you don't want, you, you would rather your queen have covered this square before you played knight to f6. Because you don't want to bring your knight into the center because then takes, takes, and then you have isolated pawns, right? So yeah, queen c7 is, is always the move on, uh, on move 5 uh, when, they, when they play this idea. You can bring your knight out now because now your queen covers this. And the reason that this move is so useful, it also stops bishop coming here, defending, uh, defending d5 another time, right? Bishop coming to c4 would also be annoying because we, we're, you know, we're the dreamer Sicilians. We want to play... We want to play uh, d5 right away, right? So um, that's why that's why we don't want that bishop coming there, right? Um, so queen queen uh, queen c7 just normally stops both. So let's go back to the Roxy bind. Roxy bind. They haven't played their knight here yet, right? So that means that they can't actually push e5 here. If they push e5 here, you just win a pawn. Check, forking the pawn. 
working here, right? Night out, you win a pawn. You should be pretty happy with this one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just uh, they can't play e5 there because they haven't brought their knight out yet, right? So um, you're very, very content to play knight f, uh, knight f6 first. All right, so yes, um, let's skip that sideline. And then after, after they bring the knight there, now they are threatening to play e5, so now you have to bring your queen there. Just a small move order thing. Bishop e2, uh, again, pretty passive, right? So you can, you can play uh, bishop to b4, right? So whenever they play passively, you can already consider bishop e4. And they haven't played a3. So um, in this scenario, they played queen c2. And um, when they play this passively, you can play knight to c6 instead of going for d6 and knight to, knight to, uh, knight to d7. So if you were to go, to go for d6 and knight d7 here, d6 makes it so that you are 100% going to trade off your dark squared bishop because you can no longer bring your 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 or your or sorry your dark squared bishop you can no longer bring your dark squared bishop back once you play d6 so um that's why uh that's one of the reasons i played uh i played like this in this scenario but um the other reason is that uh is that now this knight is undefended right they could have played queen to d3 or queen to c2 they ch they opted for queen to c2 and um now this knight is undefended uh, you will see queen c uh, queen c two a lot, especially from people who are who face a lot of Nimzo Indians. Um, so this is like a, this is like looks like a pretty normal move, but it's not good here. Um, here they could move to protect. I've seen a lot of people just take, and um, you uh, in this scenario you don't take back with the b pawn. Uh, it's going to be very very hard to get d five in. You take back with this pawn. And now your idea is going to be to just push, push the e pawn, and then um, against the Moroxy bind, uh, you're going to have this outpost because they pushed both e4 and c4, and they're not going to have this outpost. This is positionally a lot better for um, for Black because uh, they will not be able to use the square, and you will be able to use this square. So you push, you bring your two bishops back. You never want to push c5 because then that will give them the same outpost. And um, this is just positionally just really, really good. You can try to maneuver a knight there. You can try to maneuver a bishop there. It's very, very, it's very, very nice. All right. Um, it is playable for, for white, but uh, black will be just a lot more comfortable. White will have trouble getting his pieces to the optimal squares. All right. Moroxy Bind Trap. Yeah, I played this game against the 1500. I don't know where I played it against, but um, I found it in my in my archive, and uh, this is this is one kind of idea against the Moroxy bind. So um, they played this Moroxy bind structure. Uh, they have to play rook to uh, c1 before they start to play b3 or b4, and the reason for that is if they play b3 or b4 first, you already have um so what that did is that undefended this knight so now you already have b5 or d5 here i played d5 and see uh remember if you can get d5 in you're already a happy man like you're you, you've already succeeded in what you wanted to do in this sicilian so um d5 they can't take with the c pawn because now uh you can take their knight it's very very sad because they played both c4 and they played e4 they made a terrible bishop just to make sure that you couldn't play d5. And then you just play d5 anyway. It says, oh, this says good for white. Does it? Oh, uh, whatever. Um, here, here uh, but if you're allowed to get in d5, it's like, it's, uh, it, it already becomes very uncomfortable for white. I don't really care what the engine says. I've played, I've played many a position like this, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very, very hard for white to... Get out of get out of everything. So after takes takes, yeah. I mean, he was a fifteen hundred, so he didn't know what to do. He didn't want to take with this pawn, and he just pushed trying to close it up. And then I was just able to take his pieces, and he just resigned. Um. So this is a game. This next game is one that I played against my coach. Uh, he's an international master, and I was able to. I still lost the game because he's really really good, but I was able to get a better position in um 
in an opening that he didn't understand, right? So he played a Moroxy Bind structure, and he played a3 to stop the bishop b4 move. And um, if they play a3, uh, you get this is actually not great by the engine, but it's not as bad as like you know the Stafford gambits or whatever. Um, it's like it's like decent. It's like plus zero point seven, but Black gets huge counterplay, and the move is Knight takes e4. Uh, knight takes e4. If you take a look at these master games, like a lot of them are winning for black, and these are like these are big names that you that you hear about. Peter Spidler, right? Peter Spidler played this in a classical game, and he beat Alexander Morozevich, like very very strong players, right? Um, this so this like offers a lot of counterplay for for uh, for black, and the idea is that once you bring your queen here, you're winning your piece back. And you have you still have those two center pawns. So my coach played here, and um, I. Uh, so we're still following famous games here. Um, after this, I kind of messed up, uh, and I lost. But uh, the idea is that you can still play like this, like you can you can, you still can win this uh, kind of position. If if I go back to right here, I think this is already better for black. Yeah, I didn't. I just didn't know how to convert it properly, because this is the first time I ever got to spring the trap. Uh, but yeah, um, it's very very hard to play uh, as as white here. Uh, if he takes, if he brings it in here, you can just take and you just play against this weak pawn here. You castle, try to swing your knight uh, like this, so that you can attack this weak pawn. Yeah. This is uh, th uh, you're already up a pawn as black, and eventually, once this pawn falls, you'll be able to control the center completely. Yeah, I just didn't know exactly the best way to punish this. This was like a this was a three minute blitz game, but um, yeah, I made my I made my coach think for a minute when when it looked like I blundered a piece. Yeah, um, and like yeah, if if an international man how to play against this, I'm sure that your opponents, whatever rating they might be, also probably doesn't know how to play against this. All right, let's uh, go on to a next game. This was a, uh, yeah, so I think that's enough of the Moroxy bind. Um, wait, I think I didn't discuss the uh, A6 or A3 Moroxy bind. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is another thing that I want to discuss. So A3 is the, is the idea that I played against my, um, uh, my coach. And uh, yeah, so you can already play d5 here, right? d5, linchpin of all Sicilians. You're winning back a lot of things. Um, this is just, well, I don't know what the engine says, but yeah, uh, it's good for black apparently. But uh, yeah, this position is just a lot easier to play for black. All right, so uh, let's go on to some other weird systems that you might see against... Um, that you might see against your con-like structure. And um, uh, what's nice about the con is you can actually, a lot of them like transpose into each other or like uh, at least the Alpin and the Smithmore do. And the Alpin and the Smithmore are probably the two like offbeat um, ideas that you'll see against the Sicilian most often. Uh, the Alpin being um, C3 here and the Smithmore being like uh, D4 right away without even playing this knight out. Um, yeah, point two for white is nothing. Yeah, okay, so uh, this is the Alpin. The idea is you still play what you regularly play, and after they play C3, they can't bring their knight out to defend this anymore, right? So um, you just bring your knight out, attack this pawn, and you're basically hoping for them to play E5. Um, and E5 is a fine move. There's nothing wrong with it, but... Um, you're kind of already getting them out of their comfort comfort zone. As as an Alpin player, um, yeah, e5 is the best move. But as an Alpin player, like they're they want to get this strong pawn center, like d4, uh, d4, e4, and uh, them having to play e5 early kind of makes it uncomfortable for them. So this is like the main idea here: takes takes, and then knight out, knight out, and like like ninety percent of my opponents will play this when they play the Alpin system. Um, you can play d6 here, and although it looks like you're going to be getting double isolated pawns here, you're going to be trading these. And this is actually good for you, because this bishop 
now has scope. This bishop before, when you played e6, is not able to get out, but now it can. And uh, you're going to... How do you see what he's talking about? You have to go to the, um, uh, the study. Yes, somebody post it. Thank you. Yes, all right. Um, so uh, this, this looks bad, but it's already good. Because this this bishop can come out. Um, that's and you're going to be recapturing here. You might end up with an IQP, but an IQP in this scenario is fine. Uh, the most common move played against me is bishop g5 here, and I can already play queen b3 attacking this pawn, right? And um, if they capture here, I'm I'm glad to capture back. And we both have IQPs in that scenario, so um, you can just enjoy like a pretty pretty simple game in this in this um, in this. And um, it's a system that a lot of people are unfamiliar with because this has technically become like an Aliakin's defense. Like if we go back here, this is like a form of the of the Alakin, Aliakin, Alakin's defense. Um, and they're not going to be familiar with this position, right? Um, you and if you've if you've played, you've probably played against more um, Smith, Moore, and Alapins, which are like offbeat already. So. Um, they're going to be unfamiliar with this position, and you're going to be familiar with this position because uh, you get it from the Smith Moore as well. And let me just show you what I mean by that. So this is a game. Uh, this is this is like the Smith Moore move order. So in the Smith Moore, you sacrifice the C pawn, and here you just decline it. Here you play knight to uh, knight to f3. They they will if they can't take the pawn, or else you can take the e pawn, right? So they push, and this is starting to look a little bit familiar, right? You get this alkyne structure with the missing C pawns, and um, yeah, they take again. This is this is exactly the game, the same as the previous game. So you're going to be way more familiar with these structures, and uh, I I encourage everybody to do their own analysis in in these kind of games because um, there's just way too many lines, and you're not even going to see this very often. But um, if if you're getting it from two different transpositions, then that means you're going to be seeing it twice as often. As your opponent is, because they're only going to be playing the, their Smith Mora or they're they're only going to be playing their Alpin system, right? So you're going to be seeing it, seeing it way more often than your opponent is, and you're just going to be way more familiar with this kind of position. All right. Um, I don't know what the engine says. Minus zero point one. All right, that's decent. Okay. Close Sicilian. Uh, Close Sicilian is characterized by knight to c3 first. And um, knight to c3 first, generally they want to get like this kind of structure in and bring their bishop here. And what's nice is d3 will end up with like uh, a tempo down in the French. So let me explain how that works. If you play e6, um, I get to play here. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, if they play d3 in this scenario, which a lot of close Sicilian players will do, you can already play d5. And remember, d5, you're happy with. You played e6 to prop up d5, and they just let you have it, right? So after d, after takes, because they don't want you to get in d4, um, takes, takes. Um, the best idea here is actually, uh, or I'm not sure if it's the best idea, but like they probably want to stop d4 again. So they, a lot of people just play d4 themselves. And since they played both d3 and then d4, this is now like an exchange French kind of, but they're down a tempo. If they play e5, if they play e5 in this, they could. Yeah, they could. But e5 is uh e5, you just go after the weaknesses, right? So um you end up in like this kind of French-like structure, but they instead of being able to play d4, they have played d3, right? So this pawn becomes a little bit weaker because um it's no longer it's no longer propped up by d4. So you could play knight here, here, or you could play knight here, here, and um, basically enjoy a French structure, but um, they've played d3 instead, so they didn't really get that optimal pawn center. Um, so take, yeah, takes, takes. This is, this, is, this is just not good for them, I think. Takes here. I mean, if they take there, that's bad. But um, like a move like this... Uh, you would have to play with an IQP structure, but you have like the bishop pair. Um, I think this is perfectly okay. Their queen is a little bit misplaced on c5. 
Uh, will we keep the lecture public? Yeah. It's being recorded. What about the stone wall? Um, stone wall. Uh, you mean like... Wait. Uh, stone wall structure as in... D, uh, you, you mean D4 and F4? You can't play D4 and F4 in this scenario. Because you can take on D4, right? The Sicilian stops D4. Is that, is that what you mean? <laughs> Stonewall? Uh, E4, D3, C4. E4, D3, and C4. Is that called the stone wall? I thought the stone wall was D4 and F4. Maybe I'm thinking about something else. Oh, uh, well, uh, oh, this structure, I don't know. You just, you just take advantage of the hole, right? So you just try to stick as many pieces as you can on D4. If they, if they try to, if they purposely make a hole like this, I don't know. You just stick as many pieces as you want on D4 and make them take as much as you can, right? You just try to control D4 as much as possible and you end up with a better minor piece. What if he plays knight F3 to stop the pawn pushing? In what scenario? They play knight F3 to stop the pawn pushing. Where? What move? A hole is a spot on the board where the pawn can attack it, by the way. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry if that wasn't abundantly clear. Yeah, a hole is... Wait. Um, yeah, a hole is a square where a pawn can't attack it anymore. And a hole creates outposts. So an outpost is a square where you just bring minor pieces to it. And those minor pieces, if they're taken by other minor pieces, then you replace them with your own other minor pieces. And you can just uh, continually stick minor pieces onto it until um, they trade off everything, and then you still have a minor piece in here in the end. And um, that minor piece cannot, cannot be kicked by a pawn. If it wants to be kicked by a rook, you're happy to win the exchange. And uh, it, it can just be a very, very strong piece because it's no longer able to be kicked by pawns. Uh, I, I don't know what, I don't know what um, knight f3 to stop the pawn pushing means. Knight f3 where? Here? Like here, I mean, this is fine. You can uh, you can play a six. Try to go into the con structure again if they play this. If they play, if they play, um, so you can play a six. They play this. You end up going to the con structure again by transposition. If they play this, you can break in the center already, right? Okay, yeah. Um, and I'm guessing most of you are relative beginners. And you'll see something called the beginner system. And uh, that's when people bring their bishops out like this and their knight out like this. I'm sure everyone has seen it. <laughs> I'm sure everyone has, I'm sure everyone in this lecture has seen it once or twice. Definitely like pretty much all the time, right? Like, oh, I wanna play in a, uh, what is it? Is it Spanish or Italian? It's like, oh, I wanna play in Italian, but against the Sicilian. Yeah, uh, this is like, this is like not good already. So here um, you can play knight f6 and knight f6 um, attacking this pawn they can play d3 if they want but uh, the most common the most common way they'll play it is e5 because hey look free e5 right and then here you get to play d5 and if it takes en passant you take and you get some pretty awesome development and their bishop is misplaced because you played e6 right yeah so another thing I forgot to mention E6 actually is, uh, E6 stops this bishop from being so powerful, right? If I were to play D6 instead here, this bishop would be way more powerful. It is attacking F7, right? There might be ideas of bringing the knight here, um, having some kind of attack against F7. This bishop has a lot more scope. But if I play E6, I really stop this beginner system from really working at all. 
right? So I might not be able to get in d5 as easily, but like their bishop is not really that good, you know? Like this bishop is no, it's just, it's like trying to eat this pawn. There's like two pawns protecting it. Like, what is he doing here? You know? So yeah, uh, th this is this is kind of like a trap. Um, if I turn on the engine here, I'm sure it'll say that this is not a good move. Yeah. So you can play you can play this already. If they try to check, you can save your piece, right? So and now you'll be getting this French structure, but again they haven't played d4, so this is kind of like a weaker pawn, right? So yeah, uh, that's that's one example of it. If they play d3. You can just be pretty happy. Oh, you're you're actually also a little bit better here. Um, that's that's the power of the e6 Sicilian. Uh, of the e6 Sicilian, you can prop up d uh, d5 so quickly, All right? You can just. Oh, I think. Wow. Okay. Best move is already d5. Cool. So d5 takes takes. Again, you have this. Um, you have this French like structure or or this exchange French like structure, but instead of playing d4, they played d3. And they'll they're gonna have to eventually break with d4 again, and then you're just uh, in an exchange French, but you're up a tempo. Seems pretty good to me. Yeah. So uh, yeah, th those are the main systems that you're gonna be covering against the Sicilian Con. I looked at my um, uh, opening tree, and I couldn't find any other. There are like some offbeat systems like um, the wing gambit and stuff like that, but I don't. I didn't really have enough games in those. Um, to think that they were warned about talk, uh, they were warranted to be talking about. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's it. Uh, how long was that lecture? Oh, almost exactly an hour. <laughs>